one of the overarching themes of this course is to show how history is not just about doing research in the archives, taking a bunch of information and writing down that information and making an argument, but rather, and we've seen this a little already, history is tied distinctively to different nations, different groups, and it's very much part of society, well beyond the classroom, well beyond the research seminar. And we begin to see that today, especially in this lecture about Orientalism, post-colonialism, and subaltern studies. Because what we are going to be doing is we are going to be focusing on one individual and a group that he influenced, Edward Said, and the subaltern studies group in India. And in doing so, what we are going to see is that in fact, histories of old, prior to the 20th century especially, but really into the mid 20th century, history was about power. It was a way that Western nations, European nations, um, kept rising nations still relatively young, many of them not yet independent until the mid to late 20th century from really showing their true nature. And that is what we're gonna get, be getting into today, looking at how individuals associated with this idea of Orientalism, post-colonialism and subaltern studies used history to show that the West wasn't necessarily the best and that there was a different perspective from outside of the capitals of New York City, London, Paris, so on and so forth. Before we get to Edward Said himself, we need to look at one of the biggest influences on his thinking, and that is the individual that we see to the left on the screen. He is a French philosopher and historian by the name of Michel Foucault. So with the publication by Edward Said of Orientalism in 1978, we see a tremendous change in the direction of history. And the reason why is this man, Edward Said, who was a cultural critic from the Middle East, he became one of the founders of what became known as post-colonial studies. But nonetheless, like I said, before we get to some of Said's specific ideas, I want to talk about this man on the left again, who heavily influenced the thinking of Edward Said. And that again was Michael Foucault. So let's talk a little bit about one term in particular, one idea, if you will, especially, and that is Michel Foucault's notion of discourse. Foucault described or defined discourse as, quote, practices that systematically form the objects of which they speak. Now, this is a little complicated to understand some of the language used here, but basically what is going on here is basically the power of words to turn something, an idea, into a reality, to form an object through the use of words. And that is essentially what Foucault is saying here with this statement. Such discourse is portrayed in Foucault's writing as both universal and scientific, and thus it becomes essentially accepted as truth. In other words, for Foucault, discourse involved a series of statements made by dominant groups in society to create a truth by imposing specific knowledge, disciplines, and values upon dominated groups. In short, language seemed to portray the world as it actually existed, though this could not be further from the truth. Put another way, Foucault saw this discourse, his idea of discourse, as a form of power, which served to confine people within specific ways of understanding the world and their place in it. Again, going back to that notion I mentioned earlier about the power of words. As a result, this idea of discourse, uh, when it was now deemed the truth and objective, it held a certain aura of power as we talked about it. And that power was essentially manifested as a form of colonialism really, because as a result, colonialism, when we understand this idea of discourse, colonialism was no longer just a historical event that created institutions and systems of government, physical structures, but rather a discourse, again, language that extended far beyond the colonial era.
with that word and that idea in mind, now let's turn to the man himself, Edward Said, and his creation of a counterinsurgent language with the publication in 1978 of his book, Orientalism. With this book, Orientalism, in 1978, Edward Said showed the consequences of one culture trying to represent another. In doing so, an other, quote, other, is created, which is basically a cultural construct perceived as wholly opposite, and not surprisingly inferior, of one's own culture. And this again is all done through the discourse, through language. In said's hands, the idea of discourse is used to show how the system of statements created about the East in this case, the Orient, if you will, Asia in particular, we would see through the system of statements created about the East, i.e. the discourse, helps the West dominate and colonize the Oriental. Like Foucault, Said understood the permanence of discourse. As he wrote in Orientalism, not the section that you read for this week, but another, Oriental, quote, shares with magic and with mythology the self-containing, self-reinforcing character of a closed system in which objects are what they are because they are what they are for once, for all time, for ontological reasons, that no imperial, empirical material can, neither dis, can either dislodge or alter. So here with this quote, we see the power again of words and the longevity of words extending across time. The idea that these words and this image that is created, this discourse that is created by the West has important long-standing ramifications for the East that is trying to create its own history one that is distinct from what the West is saying the East is all about. So as a result, with this in mind, for said, it was not possible to change the idea of Orientalism, making it a repressive Western structure in a closed system whereby subjects are trapped for all time. Therefore, with this in mind, said would come out here in 1978, writing this book to again sort of overcome that closed system and break open that closed system. Using discourse, in fact, allowed said to move away from a narrow and technical understanding of colonial authority that focused simply on that physical colonial governments that I referred to earlier. Said acknowledges much some 25 years after he published Orientalism. As said wrote in 1993, direct colonialism has largely ended, but and here's the important part, quote, imperialism lingers where it has always been in a kind of general cultural sphere, as well as in specific political, ideological, economic, and social practices. By unmasking this discourse in Orientalism, said hope to transfer attention away from the West and the nation state of the West, the various nation states that were again dominant in global history, and move it towards an alternative, a subaltern. And I'm gonna come back to this, this term later on in this lecture, the subaltern. But nonetheless, what we are seeing here, as he wrote towards the end of Orientalism, Orientalism itself represented what said described as a quote, science of imperialism. But he hoped that his book would help quote, reduce the effects of imperialist shackles on through and human relations. So clearly, excuse me, on thought and human relations. So clearly we see this book in 1978 as the opening salvo, if you will, in this war against Orientalism, in this war against the discourse that had been stamping on the Orient a particular idea of what it stood for. And this idea, again, did not originate in the East, but it rather originated in the West as a form of colonialism through the use of this language. Before we move on to this idea of subaltern studies, I want to explain very briefly here what Edward said was fighting, at least in part. And that was the idea of national history. Now, interestingly enough, national history has a long history, and one of its primary forces and advocates, if you will, was an individual 
a historian that we talked about previously, and that is the German historian Leopold von Ranke. And what we are going to see is Ranke's scientific history led to the dominance of political history. So why, why am I making this argument, or why is it the case that Ranke's scientific history led to the dominance of political history? Well, the state became central to history in Ranke's thinking because governments produced much of the material used by historians in the archives. This resulted in the creation of a national history, as historical writing became intimately associated with the development of national identities. By the 19th century, in fact, History focused almost entirely on the history of the nation state, the country. Such an approach, therefore, tended to basically ignore, push aside non European peoples and nations. And again, it was this lack of interest in these non European peoples and nations that led to sort of a false history being created, that discourse that we've been talking about earlier, that creation of the Orient and Orientalism, that is what happens. So eventually, we are going to see, even as a lot of these third world nations that were previously in the shackles of colonialism, they began to achieve independence after World War II. And even as this occurred, scholars from these areas were actually eager to demonstrate to the world that they could meet the standards of Western historical scholarship. Consequently, these historians from places like Africa and India created their own national histories to mirror those of the West. For instance, following Indian independence in 1947, when Britain finally freed India, we would see the new government encourage histories of the struggle for independence but when these histories were actually produced after 1947, the new government, what, the, the focus on, these, on this resistance and struggle, it was still sort of centered around the state and national leaders. In other words, Indian historians looked for their national identity in past political and intellectual elites, just as those Western scholars had done. And in the process, they too, these Indian historians would ignore ordinary people. They would ignore the subaltern, as we'll talk about now in this last and final slide of the lecture. Even though national history sort of implanted its hook in a lot of these third world nations, and the historians in these third world nations replicated the same national history that did Western nations previously, we would see by the last quarter of the 20th century, post-colonial historians, as they became known, began to argue that the narrative of the nation state had become too oppressive and it denied alternative versions of the past. Therefore, they would attempt to construct a new archive. Now, one of the arguments made consistently in support of national history was the idea that this was the history that was predominant because it was those sources, the government officials, the elites, if you will, who left these records behind. There was no way we could find the available evidence, evidence as scientific historians. Remember, Ronke was big on the idea that we need the archives. We cannot tell the story of people who have not left behind their archives. So therefore, the post-colonial historians knew that they would have to deal with this, this argument that true scientific history needs and relies on archives. So therefore, what is going to happen is a lot of these, these post-colonial scholars, they're going to rely more so on oral histories from these people who may not have written stuff down, but they have memories of what happened. We will also see these post-colonial historians rely on non-governmental records um, that sometimes foreign corporations will talk about what happened within that. Now, even the government documents themselves that post-colonial historians sort of detest because they were used by national historians, even these documents could be useful for post-colonial historians. And the reason why is because these post-colonial historians could essentially uh, read them against the grain, sort of look for hints of what is going on among the people as told in these official government documents. But nonetheless, regardless of how they did it through whichever archives they used, 
post-colonial historians began to look at history not from the perspective of the colonizer, but rather through the eyes of the colonized, showing how these individuals who were leading the fight against colonial governments carried out armed resistance and mobilized politically to confront the, the colonial state and gain independence. Such studies found their greatest support in India in the 1980s, due largely to the efforts of Ranjit Guha's subaltern studies group. Now in terms of the, the phrase itself, subaltern, they chose, did the subaltern studies group, to use subaltern to describe their brand of history. Now subaltern itself actually came from the Marxist theoretician Antonio Gramsci, who used the term to describe disempowered groups and in fact, what we are going to see is essentially, this is again, um, what we've talked about previously as a form of history from below, if you will, this, these disempowered groups. And Guha's subaltern altern studies group attempted to show how this subaltern played a key role in India's nationalist uprising. For instance, in 1983, Guha published Elementary Aspects of Peasant Insurgency in Colonial India in which he discussed 117 peasant uprisings during Britain's rule of India. Guha claimed that, quote, Indian nationalism derived much of its striking power from a subaltern tradition, therefore proving the lie that only certain elites in India fought the British colonial rule. And this included, of course, the peasant uprisings that is at the heart and soul of this 1983 book by Guha. So subaltern studies, in short, represented an attack against nationalist historiography in favor of history from below. As said wrote 15 years after, or excuse me, 10 years after he wrote Orientalism of these efforts of the subaltern studies group, he said, quote, hitherto Indian history has been written from a colonialist and elitist point of view. But the subaltern studies group attempted to, in his words, offer a theory of change. And that again is how I wanna end this lecture by referring to a point that I made at the start. And that was the fact that this sort of history was again, not just necessarily about writing a history, a particular history of India, a subaltern history of India, rather than a nationalist history of India, but rather it was an effort to show that this change occurred and that more change could take place. That history was not static, as a lot of the Western nations like to think when they described the exotic Orient that was the focus of their attention.